All right. Thanks for being here again. Uh, thank you, audience, for tuning in to the continued conversation with Dr. Baumgartner and her work, South to Freedom, uh, which is phenomenal. So the next question that I have, um, and hopefully this will stimulate a lively uh, conversation, uh, is most Civil War scholarship focuses on Black military service in the United States Colored Troops, or USET, of which I study, and many others as well. But how does your work demonstrate that there is a much longer history of Black military service, service sorry, if we look towards Mexico? I think that incorporating this history, a broader history of Black military service across North America, if not the Americas, mm. is really important to being able to understand this as, a, as an even larger movement beyond just the United States. Right. It helps to also see what's unique about the United States, what's exceptional about the United States, uh, and what is really part of this much broader movement of people of color joining the military and in the process making these broader claims to freedom and citizenship and helping to explain why it was that we move from the 18th century where slavery is the norm right. to the 19th century where slavery is being abolished. Mm -hmm. uh, in my work, I, comparative history is really important and I think it's explicit in this book. Right. But I think that as historian Peter Guardino has argued in his great book, The Dead March, that every piece of historical scholarship is comparative, even if it is implicit. And so mm -hmm. I think that, and I wanna sort of make that point by drawing out some of these comparisons between the United States uh, military service and the USCT mm -hmm. and what's going on in Mexico and, and more broadly in Latin America, mm -hmm. that in Mexico, we see a lot of similarities in black military service as we do in the United States. That as in the United States, you, we can see this military service as more than just joining an official army, that it can also mean taking up arms in other less official capacities, less recognized capacities that in Mexico's case, in 1829, Mexico was invaded by Spain. And we again see people of color from the United States taking up arms to help defend mm -hmm. Mexico from the Spanish incursion. And we also see the Mexican government trying to forge an alliance with Haiti mm -hmm. to invade Cuba by promising freedom to enslaved people in Cuba. This plan obviously doesn't work, right. but there are a couple of enslaved attempted slave revolts in Cuba where the enslaved people are being recorded as saying that they were revolting in anticipation of a combined Mexican Haitian force. So this is a not they those those enslaved people are not taking up arms officially, but they are taking up arms in ways that are showing cracks in the foundation of human bondage in ways that are really important. We see African Americans enslaved people taking up arms, escaping to Mexican lines during the Texas Revolution in ways that are really important that I go into more in the book, but we'll sort of gloss over here. So we're seeing again military service. We can think of military service. In a, in a more expansive way than um, just putting on a uniform and being able to formally join the army. Of course, all of this, uh, this, this type of military service makes it, it sort of paves the way for this more formal military service. Right. Um, in Mexico, as in the United States, this military service broadly defined helps to push Mexico to take a more anti-slavery stance in much mm. the same way that African Americans escaping to union lines helps to push the Lincoln administration to change the terms of the war from saving the union to uh, abolishing slavery. So again, we're seeing uh, black military service as really integral to this larger story of abolition. And of course, as uh, it's key to citizenship claims that military service is foundational both in Mexico and in the United States to uh, formerly enslaved people making claims to political belonging in both Mexico and the United States. One difference um, between Mexico and other parts, well, it's, it's a difference that we also see in the United States, but one difference that I have been thinking about recently is that while we see military service leading to 
abolition and citizenship rights in both Mexico and the United States, earlier instances of conflict don't necessarily lead to emancipation more broadly, they lead to manumission. What I mean by that is in Latin American wars for independence, and we see this again in conflicts in the United States that enslaved people are recruited to join the military effort in exchange for manumission, the promise of their individual freedom, but that that doesn't always translate to uh, emancipation more broadly. And this was certainly true of Latin American wars of independence in Mexico and elsewhere. And so I think the comparison also helps us to think about why it is that in this, in some instances, military service led to emancipation, other circumstances that led to a much more limited manumission. Mm -hmm. So to sum up, I think the, the compared looking at the broader history of uh, black military participation can really help us to better understand not just the mechanisms of that military participation, what it meant, but also to help us conceive of this as a much broader, a more hemispheric uh, phenomenon that we, we need to study beyond the national borders and able, yes. in order to fully appreciate and fully understand. Yeah, I mean, I've got a lot of notes right now because you're giving me a lot to think about and some uh, I wanted to throw out to the audience to consider, myself included, but also just to maybe ask you for this because I'm curious. So, um, I mean, one thing that I've been toying with uh, is creating a course that looks at Black military service, uh, particularly in the Americas. Um, and what you've already stated, you know, whether we're talking about the 1829, the Haitian Revolution, and the overtures of Mexico with Haiti, right, to involve itself in this international conflict, the, the revolution in Texas, is that I can't teach that class without recognizing that there is this, this important history that's also happening in some cases at the same time, or, you know, at least around these periods when Black military service is happening. And I say this generally I'm you know have focused on uh, the Revolutionary War maybe the War of 1812 the Battle of New Orleans um, and just like these uh, various moments but not so much these other international conflicts that clearly were they needed black men um, and, and particularly I'm sure black women were involved maybe their service wasn't recognized for the important ways in which they're also involved because that's always the case is women are critical to understanding military service and, and, and conflicts. It's just whether or not the military reckon, and society recognizes their important value. So I think that to me that your book, and hopefully, I mean, it sounds like if this isn't already done, that somebody might wanna do this kind of international focus of black military service, one, so I can read it, uh, and two, so it can, it can further deepen, as you point out, what's happening beyond the United States or uh, you know, during the revolution or where the colonies I think it was interesting when you talk about the empowerment and racial aspect of military service, which those calls are being made by Douglas, Frederick Douglass um, and, and many others um, throughout, you know, uh, and even their white allies during the Civil War era and in even earlier. But you're demonstrating that black men, particularly in Mexico or that go to Mexico, uh, are achieving it uh, and that it's, it's pushing the federal government to reassess slavery and in, in its borders, which I think is profound. Uh, so I was just curious when you talked about the manumission rather than emancipation, right? The individual versus universal, which is how I was processing that. Was there from, from your readings and in your research, do you see that there was contention within um, the political spectrum on what, why not just go full fully uh, towards emancipation? Um, or was there just apprehension? Was there concern about United States um, getting involved and maybe what that could lead to. I'm, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so earlier, before Mexico officially abolishes slavery in 1837, mm -hmm. one of the things that they're really worried about is the United States using Mexico's promise of freedom to enslaved mm -hmm. people as an excuse for invading Mexico and claiming even more of its territory uh, than it would in the 1840s. And they, Mexican politicians are very much aware of what happened in Florida when Andrew Jackson invaded and, yeah. and seized Florida and 
obviously he had many pretexts for that, but one of which was the fact that enslaved people were escaping to Florida and through royal decrees were, were receiving a measure of security. So there was this uh, kind of very legalistic concern that when enslaved people were granted freedom in that earlier period before 1837 abolition, that it was for particular reasons. They did something, it wasn't uh, universal, it was individual. And so I do think that that is an important part of the story, the political concerns uh, for Mexico, which is much less powerful than the United States. So it has this uh, Porfirio Diaz, who was Mexico's uh, president in the late 19th and early 20th century said, you know, poor Mexico, so, um, so far from God, so close to the United States, that the, the United States is a, is a threat to, to Mexico. Right. Um, but just because Mexico is powerless doesn't mean it is without power altogether. And so it's very carefully using anti-slavery in ways that will help it to uh, protect itself against the more powerful United States. I mean, that's actually really, it's an amazing point about black freedom, the concern on the Mexican government and people about the limits of black freedom, primarily, it sounds like uh, from the concerns of the United States and those uh, slave owners or those who profit from slavery um, and, and the potential, you know, international conflict, war, if you will, uh, that that's going to break out, which is something, again, I, and I know I've been saying this a lot, but it's like, I've never fully considered that as a reality when clearly it's a reality um, for, and the complexity of what it shows of the importance of Africans and African-Americans um, to international conflict, to internet, to nation states, to, to navigating, what does it mean to be a citizen? You know, like freedom, I think this is just really profound. The other question that I had, which is actually the reason I had anticipated originally buying your book, um, but as I read your book, I realized it was so much more than what I had thought it would be, um, which is great, is uh, so the, a number of regiments, the USCT regiments that I study are in Texas, or right, sorry, they're, they're in Texas at the Rio Grande at the border because of the supposed invasion of Napoleon III, particularly after the long after, you know, the Civil War is officially over, the black soldiers uh, from like particularly Pennsylvania and other state, New York, um, they can't go home because the federal government in the United States is saying, you got to stay at the border. And there's these interesting interactions with Mexican people who in many cases, as I and many others have shown, is are, are helping to supply black soldiers with clean water, um, which, because it's being stolen from their officers due to ineptitude and um, just bad uh, transmission of resources, particularly the farther away they went from the military stations and bases. But I wondered, did you see any, can, um, any of that in your research, the USCT and the post, uh, I guess the immediate post-war, um, or any conversations uh, of USCT soldiers, maybe with uh, black soldiers from Mexico, like just curious on your thoughts on that or. Yeah, well, the, the way in which USCT came up most for me in my research was that in Mexico's foreign relations archive, there are two huge folders with requests by soldiers in the United States to come to Mexico to fight for Benito Juarez, who is the leader of Mexico's movement against the French intervention, the imposition of uh, this Austrian Archduke Maximilian as the emperor of Mexico right. while the United States is embroiled in civil war. Right. And a lot of these petitions are coming from white soldiers who mm -hmm. Uh, either want bounties for joining the Mexican army, perhaps they also see as many US citizens increasingly do over the course of uh, the late 18, you know, 1864, 1865, they see the French intervention as a threat to what has been achieved in the US Civil War. But what was most interesting to me in those two big files were the black regiments who were trying to fight for Benito Juarez because they saw the Emperor Maximilian as a threat not just to the freedom of Mexico as a republic, and by that I mean the ability of Mexico to determine for itself what its system of government would be, but the freedom of Mexico as a place where slavery does not exist, that there were rumors that 
Maximilian was going to reestablish slavery and Confederates were, of course, as, as historians have long shown, already going to Mexico in hopes of being able to forge a slaveholding community there from which they could uh, you know, continue to hold people as property. And so I was seeing USCT veterans mm. volunteering, trying to go to Mexico to fight for Juarez. And I'm not sure that I have no evidence that any of them actually right. succeeded, but uh, this we, we've been sort of glancingly talking about how much were African-Americans aware of what was going on in Mexico. And this is another example of how aware they were and how they conceived of what was going on in Mexico as intertwined with what was going on in the United States. I mean, uh, maybe and it's very possible there's a graduate student who's already doing this work. And if so, I need to read this. Uh, I hope so. I hope there is. Yeah, this I mean, what you're saying to me is is amazing because I'm looking at it of particularly if we look at black USCT soldiers who are directly involved in the liberation of, of enslaved people in the United States then see the, the, they continue the cause in Mexico, which is clearly not something that people like Frederick Douglass or, or you know, the publishers of the weekly Anglo-African Christian Recorder are talking about, at least that I've seen. So that black soldiers use the skills, um, the, the drives that they have to continue the fight for freedom. Uh, and I also it just makes me wonder, just as a thought to the audience, um, I'm really curious on potentially those who may have deserted from USCT regiments that go or are petitioning to be a part of Mexico because they understand the fight for freedom, but also the potential aspect of actually getting full citizenship, which they don't get uh, during the war and immediate post-war. So there's some great projects out there that yeah. need somebody write and I need to read it and cite it um, because it's, it's an important topic that deserves more attention. And also, as you point out, to our previous conversations shows the, the importance of Mexico in understanding the African-American experience, particularly related to freedom and citizenship in a multitude of ways. So thank you for that. Thank you so much for having me.